and the journey right. that I've sort of gone on in past years to figure that out. And then after that, I'll show you some stuff that was made by other people. Um, okay, so, and you can hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, it sounds really good. Good. So the first thing I'm going to show you is the only thing that I kept from my very first ceramics class um, that I took when I was a freshman in college, and I had never done pottery before. It was an intro class where we covered hand building and wheel, and there was this incredible um, assignment that was given called the ugly cup. <laughs> and um, it's funny because the only things I think that were made in that class that were beautiful were the ugly cups. So this is my ugly cup. <laughs> it was made on the wheel and it's something that I just sort of, uh, you know, when you're, when you're throwing and you're making uneven pulls and you're coming up towards the top and it starts to fray along the rim mm -hmm. because of the uneven pull and you don't know how to settle it back out. I just kept doing that and let it, let it keep fraying and get thin and break along the edge and then made a little handle to kind of go with it. Oh, and I love so, it. It's really nice. <laughs> so when I really got into pottery, it was mainly because I loved um, painting with underglazes. And before I started making sculptures to paint on with underglazes, I was really just trying to make functional pottery with decorative designs with underglaze. But then I wanted them to be functional. And so I was trying to figure out what kinds of colors and what glazes would work well. And unfortunately, most of the colorful stuff that I was able to get with under glazes that were glazed and functional, I've either given away or they've been broken by roommates. I don't have much of that left, but I do have the majority of the stuff, which is um, blacks and blues. So um, this is basically my oldest pottery that I've made. So this is a plate made on the wheel. So it's black underglaze with um, just a clear, clear glaze and it's cone 10. So it was, um, the clear was actually like a celadon, like a kind of a gray celadon um, made in 2010. And then these are two dishes that are basically the same idea. And I just really love how the black underglaze gets these kind of silvery tones. I don't know if you can see, but they kind of um, flash silver a little bit where the glaze um, can like, I don't know, it, it kind of, um, it gets soaked in just a little bit by the underglaze and so it doesn't completely flux on the surface and you get these little silver spots. Mm -hmm. So this is another one. Nice. 2009. And is that, was around that time like when you began ceramics or it, that's when you started? I I guess the first class was, was 2002 when I first started college. Took two years off and then got back into it 2003, two th no 2004 and then it was probably about a year of just playing around. Probably by 2005 I was feeling more compelled and like serious about it and spending more time in that studio. Mm -hmm. So then I've got these, which are basically the same idea, but instead of um, a clear on top, it's Shino. It's what? It's a Shino glaze. Oh. So um, for those of you who may not know, um, some glazes have a super long history to them. And Shino is one of these glazes. It's a Japanese glaze that is known for giving you these really natural um, flashes and tones, um, kind of orange and gray. Show you the plates too. So you can see some of the orange along the edge where it gets a little thin. And the way that the, the underglaze looks under these are kind of like a warmer tone as compared with the one that's just clear on top. Mm -hmm. So these were wheel thrown, my first plate set. I think I made, I, I got about 20 made and I've got probably eight left 
from just life and moving and roommates and um, things like maybe getting left at potlucks and stuff. Could you, um, I, these are great. It's, it's nice to see like the atmospheric quality or the, the Shino flashing coming out, but then those like crisp um, patterns and paintings. Um, yeah, so Shino is like, uh, could you talk about like what's happening or like, um, I guess what kind of clay is that? What kind of kiln did you fire it in? And then what like goes on with the flashing? I think um, like there are a couple gas kilns in Brooklyn and in the city, but some some people might not have had that experience before. Mm -hmm. So, um, Shino is a high fire glaze. I'm not aware of any like mid range Shinos, although there are probably some Kun 6 mid range glazes that are inspired by the look of Shino, I imagine, because it's kind of an OG glaze that's probably been the source of inspiration for lots of glaze formulation. But this clay is, uh, it's called B Mix, and that's all I remember about it. It's just a Kun 10 white glaze. Um, I think it's pretty popular in California, and I believe it's made by Laguna. Mm -hmm. Laguna is a, a brand that makes ceramic supplies. Now, um, the, the reason why those oranges happen, I, I know, but I don't have a great way of explaining it, but it has to do with the reduction, mm -hmm. of the amount of oxygen in the kiln when you're firing it. So I, I, did, I did not fire them myself because I was a student, but they were fired in the gas kiln and it was a reduction firing. Do you wanna say something about how reduction firing works? Uh, yeah, so that's kind of like all I was like getting at was just that the idea that there's like different atmospheres or different ways of firing than, than we do at yeah. Brooklyn Clay. But um, yeah, reducing, so the reduction atmosphere um, changes like the chemistry of what's going on with the clay and glaze. And so there's a um, oversupply of fuel. So the fuel is, is searching for oxygen so that it can ignite and combust. And so it's gonna actually change um, change the composition or the chemistry of like the glazes that are in that kiln. So someone could, I also don't know like exactly what's happening to make a Shino flash like that, but that reduction atmosphere is important for it to happen. Yeah, and it also has to do with the fact that it's a glaze that shows different qualities based on its thickness. So like, you know how when you look at a certain glaze, you'll see that where the rim is, where the glaze sort of melted and, and, and fell off of that space, okay. you have a certain tone. And then some glazes, it's just the same color, even where, where it ran off and where it ran to. And Shino is just a glaze that has that variation. So where it's thinner, it will be more orange. And so that's why some people, when they're working with this glaze, they'll actually spray it with some water and then dip it so that there's more variation. And also, I think this glaze is just really mysterious. I don't really have any real examples on these guys necessarily, but sometimes this glaze will get really gray in some areas, maybe where it was close to the flame. And so in addition to having the orange tones, you get these like beautiful gray, smoky spots. Um, so in addition to these guys, I want to show you this. So this is also black under glaze. This is um, a cone 10, or sorry, a cone 6 porcelain and glazed on the inside and the rim, but not on the outside. And you can see where the white, the white glaze on the inside interacted with the rim glaze. And then you get these like drips happening that I kind of liked. It's just a tea bowl. And another thought for design on the surface. So this is not under glaze, but I just pulled it down because it kind of fit with the look of the others. This is a hand-built piece that I made as a demo a couple years ago. It's brown clay. 
um, there was white slip applied here, here, and here, and on the other side, and on the inside. And then this was done with Scrofito, Scrofito design, and then bisque fired. And then I applied wax to the, all the parts that were Scrofitoed, and then dipped it in black, and then had to wipe off any bits of glaze that was on the wax and had to do a little bit of repair jobs along the side mm -hmm. because sometimes that technique doesn't work as perfectly as you'd expect. Um, but yeah, cool. so this was made by um, rolling out slabs, making a box. So the bottom was just a slab box and then the top was coiled. So the coils were laid across the top of the box and then the square, uh, the rectangular um, perimeter morphed into a cylindrical perimeter as it came up. And then the handles were just cut from a slab. With all of these, again, it's interesting to see the, like the way you're treating the surface and mm -hmm. the imagery and like patterns that are going on there. Um, because I know that I don't know your like functional background or what you're currently doing with functional pots very well, but I know your sculpture well. Um, it's inter interesting to see how far back a lot of that like pattern and surface work goes for you. Yeah, yeah, that's really what it was all about in the beginning. Because mm -hmm. the first couple of years of ceramics, the the techniques that I was working with, I was really bad at, but I loved this working with the surface. Yeah. So um, the fact that I could make something functional with a design on it was the motivation to get better at the, the techniques of building so that mm -hmm. the surface could feel like it was worthy of being on the thing. Or yeah. The thing was, was worthy of having five hours of painting on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, definitely. Were you a drawer or a painter at like before? Yeah, um, drawing and painting was my main thing in college. Mm -hmm. and ceramics was really just something I was doing for fun. And by the end of it, I had spent more, much more time in the ceramics studio than the painting studio. Yeah. And that's how it all kind of became one thing. Yeah, that's I'm focusing cool. more on ceramics because ceramics re requires so much more learning and so much more experimentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I'll show you some other stuff now that was made by other folks. Cool. Um, first thing I want to show you is this really cool cup. Um, it's a really really gritty clay. I don't actually know what clay this is. I'll have to. I'll have to ask them and find out if anyone's curious. But it it seems to be just as gritty, if not grittier than the 420 sculpture clay. Mm -hmm. So I'd be curious actually to know what that is. And then it, there's some on and these little guys here. So this cup was made by Greg Lysander, who I um, went to college with and who was a really good art friend and still is. He lives in Northern California. Um, he took these pieces of porcelain and would roll them into these strips and then when they're hard, so they're like bone dry strips of porcelain and then the clay was still wet, he would stick them in and then break them off in this pattern. That's nice. I've never really seen anything quite like that. It's super unique, yeah. He's, he's really on his own tip. Um, I hope he's still making a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I know he's, he's keeping busy, but he also makes these really beautiful sculptures with um, this imagery on it that is kind of like dark cartoon uh, sketch with some te with like text and like, mm -hmm. you know, like ghost skeletons with mm -hmm. boobs and like thought bubbles and, mm -hmm. but, but it's all like this type of um, aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you went to school with, with him, with that Yeah, writer? Greg, Greg Lysander. Somehow I want to figure out how to link like all the Instagram accounts to the people who made this stuff. Maybe, maybe I'll post it on my page or something. Yeah, or, yeah, or if you send it to us um, after, we can email everyone who is here, or, or we can post it, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
This guy was made by Kelly Justice. Do you know Kelly? No. She was at Alfred with me um, for grad school, and she's a master slipcaster. And, you know, this piece particularly is like, I think I grabbed this from a box of stuff she was just getting rid of. So yeah. it's not like a prime example of like the brilliance of her work and the, the sophisticated qualities of, of her process, but mm -hmm. I love it. It looks like the bottom of like a bottle of water almost. Totally. On there. Yeah. yeah. She, a lot of her work borrows from things that already exist. Like she made a bunch of solo cups. Mm -hmm. Cast. Yeah. Um, so this guy here is, um, it's, it was made by John Gill. Oh, really? Yeah. But anyone who knows John Gill's work, this is not an example of what he's known for. Um, but this was his take on a Japanese chawan tea bowl. And if you've ever learned or studied anything about the Japanese Zen tea ceremony, they have these really, really beautiful tea bowls that are designed um, to, in, to, to harness the aesthetic of wabi-sabi, which is the, the, the aesthetic that's associated with the Tao. And um, having something look like it was just made from nature, in a way. Mm -hmm. So... John, I believe this was a teaching demo that he had made for his class. Um, and I believe that it's a soda firing. So going back to what we were mentioning with the Shino is that there are certain things you can achieve with firing processes beyond just heating things up. So working with the variations of oxygen or, or heat that you're exposing the, the inside of the kiln to, um, you can bring out different looks in the glaze. And then there are also things that you can do where you add in elements, so like salt or soda into the atmosphere. Um, it it melt or it vaporizes, so it gets into the atmosphere and then settles on the surface of the clay. Wood firing is a good example of that. So yeah, I love this piece. Very, that's a very rare one. That's it really cool. is. Yeah. Yeah. So John Gill, um, if you don't know who that is, he's definitely someone to, to look up. His work's really unique. This so I have, there's one question in the chat that I missed. Yeah. Um, could you like briefly explain the process of slip casting for that last piece? Okay. I am not a slip caster. I have literally never slip casted. So I'm not the person to answer or explain that. Um, but <laughs> since you asked, it's basically where you take slip and usually when we're, when we're talking about slip casting, the slip that you use isn't the same as the slip you would use on the surface of a piece, right? It has to be formulated for this process. And you make a mold, you have a mold and you're pouring the slip inside the mold and it coats the exterior of the inside. And you have to make sure that it's, you know, all the way around and then you wait for it to dry a bit you pour another layer you build up the layers and then you open it up is that right Anders? yeah yeah i think yeah just like i'm i'm a uh, very mediocre slip caster on, on, i only do it when i have to but mm -hmm. yeah so like for that cup that you showed earlier that could have been like maybe Maybe I bet it was like a three part mold. So there's probably like two for like split in half and then the bottom probably had its own part as well. But like, just like Kelly's saying, the, the top would be open, the top of the mold. So you'd pour in liquid slip and then the plaster um, starts sucking out the moisture and creating a shell like, like a chocolate bunny. And then when you pour that out, you're left with like a very thin um, object. So if you like, we're used to seeing like a lot of um, like very thin, like cast production porcelain, that really lightweight stuff. Um, you can often even see like the part lines that would, that would um, be a result of part of that process. 
Mm -hmm. It's a very factory aesthetic. Yeah, if you if you YouTube slip casting, um, you'll very quickly like under. It's probably hard to understand from just like explaining it, but if you YouTube it, it'll it'll make sense really quickly if you see someone actually casting something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good technique if you're wanting to make something and then make multiples, mm -hmm. and and if you're wanting it to look perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sorry we couldn't explain more than that, but hopefully that's enough to give you an idea. Um, moving on, this beautiful little mug was made by Val Cushing. So if you don't know, uh, Val Cushing is a really famous ceramic artist who I would say is like one of the main people who founded American pottery and he was um, involved with the Alfred legacy. And I got to go on a, on a studio visit with my art history class first year of grad school, and he passed away the following year. So it was kind of a poignant time to be there in terms of understanding his life and his legacy, because we got to meet him and, and be there at a studio and then get to see you know how the community responded when he was no longer around. And then, the summer before I left Alfred, I got to know his wife, Elsie, and she gave me this cup. That's really sweet. That's really special. Hawken had a nice Valkushing cup, and then Gus has one in his possession that I use all the time, too. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. So, a couple more things here. Let's see. Um, this is a cup that I really like. This was made by John Emerson, who I went to grad school with. He's, I would say he's more of a conceptual artist and sculptor and installation artist, but you know, really good with all things clay. And this is thrown on the wheel and then it was pinched, I guess, like from four directions there. And then you can see the imprint on the inside. So it kind of has these like feet that are just inherent in the the piece it, it, they weren't added or anything and it's a pretty classic look to have the white glaze on the brown stoneware and i like this like raw edge and then another piece made by someone i was in grad school with this is made by amy bennett this is a plate that is hand built Amy, um, I think she does some throwing, but her work mainly is, is hand-built. And a lot of her work is inspired by wanting to have a really, um, a really rustic experience sitting around a table. So a lot of her plates are like, they're made to mimic the look of like a pie crust or um, the colors are meant to be really kind of luscious and delicious in and of themselves and the textures to really just kind of speak to the food that is being eaten. So it seems like this one was made with a slab at the bottom and then another slab laid across the, the perimeter of the smaller slab and then kind of pinched in. So yeah, very, it's not that heavy, uh, but it feels like it, it looks like it would be heavy. It feels very sturdy though. But I like, I love using these plates. I have a few of them. Yeah, that's nice. Is she, so I, I've never met, was she at Alfred? Because is that um, Trevor Bennett's mm -hmm. wife? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so Trevor was at Alfred a few years before and then she, got in, I guess, maybe when he was finishing. So she was in my grouping. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then this is a cool thing, and this is something I feel like I should ex show my students um, more often. I, I always forget it, but this is an object you can make that I find to be super useful. It's like a spoon rest that you can put on your stove. This was made by someone I was an undergrad with named Jordan Pfaff. And Jordan, um, super cool ceramic artist now he's like making raunchy hip-hop in southern california um yeah now he's like this like rapper or something so i i don't know if, i don't think he's doing ceramics anymore 
because he's living this like rapper life but um he made this and i've been using it pretty much every single day for like 10 years nice yeah so you just throw the dish you know the whole thing looks like that and then when it's maybe half well i would probably throw the piece and then wait about 30 minutes to an hour maybe and then um with with these fingers here just kind of pinch up and then don't touch it quick easy it's not complicated you just want to feel like your fingers are putting symmetrical pressure and let's see how how are we doing on time we, we can go for a little bit longer. Yeah, I scheduled it for a half hour. We won't get kicked off, but okay. I do have another one after this, but I have a little bit of time in between, so we can keep going. And I do have um, one question in the yeah. chat. Can you suggest books on ceramics and how to continue to create at home without clay? Books on ceramics, so, you know, it depends on whether you're wanting a book on like really like academic heady stuff where they explain techniques or if you want like a book that's with inspiring imagery with like step-by-step -step like images of people working. I find that when it comes to books it's best to get a book that is specific to the thing that you're wanting to make. So like if you want to make cups get the what is it 1000 cups or whatever it's yeah. called. Is it yeah. 10,000 cups? I feel like there's like, there's cup. definitely like a 500 cups. I'm okay. sure there's a thousand cups. Probably yeah. not 10,000 cups. Lots yeah. of cups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there's one for figures. Um, I find the textbooks about ceramics to be completely useless. That's me. Um, just because um, I learned through doing. Um, but I do have actually this book over here that I can show you that um, I think is kind of unique. It's ceramic faults. So like when you're having a problem with something, like gr something weird, usually it's with the glaze, right? Mm -hmm. um, usually when we build something and it falls apart, we know why. But with glazes, there can be a lot of problems that arise that we don't know what it is. So this gets into a lot of stuff like that. Um, and then yeah, I guess for books, just something that's inspiring. That's my best advice. Something with cool pictures. Yeah. Vitamin E, I guess, maybe. Um, they have these art books that are geared towards more like fine art and like contemporary, contemporary fine art. There's vitamin P for painting. Um, and so vitamin C is the ceramics one. So that one's pretty cool. And then the other part of the question was how to keep making ceram ceramics to, at home without clay? How to continue to create at home without clay? Yeah. Um, well, you know, creating can mean a lot of things. Three-dimensional. Th oh, three-dimensional. Well, pa paper mache, maybe? Um, I guess if you can't, I, I mean, it depends on what you have access to. Like if you have, you know, an ability to order something, you could get the pop, like basically if you're a ceramicist, if you're a clay student and you want to keep your practice going and you don't have any clay, my best suggestion would be to get your, try to, try to get some polymer clay okay which is technically not clay it bothers me that they even call it clay or self-hardening what's that self-hardening yeah mm -hmm. because it's the material that's most similar to clay yeah. and i think it'd be best to make something sculptural with mm -hmm. that stuff like don't make your best pottery with that stuff because yeah. you're really <laughs> to use it. but if you wanted to play with like making jewelry or making you know um beads making Christmas ornaments, making um, little sculptures of some kind. That could be really fun. Yeah. And then, you know, to, as far as like how to work with the material, it's very similar. It can be similar to working with clay. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good suggestion to like connect with a material in a similar way where it's like the soft malleable thing that you can like squeeze and form into something. Um, the one like, and then there's other, like depending on how you work, like if you, if you work in slabs or you, you're able to like think in templates, some people make like paper or cardboard templates and you can even do them to scale so that you can like mock up some things and then make them in the studio. But yeah. probably like the, the best advice I got about like continuing to work with clay or at least generate ideas for clay while you're not able to get into the studio. I got from a lot of professors and I only recently accepted it, which is just like get a sketchbook and start drawing. Um, and I, I don't particularly like enjoy the process of drawing. I don't usually think two dimensionally. So it seemed very like opposite to start with a piece of paper and a pencil to then create a pot or a sculpture. Yeah. But I found that the more I did it, um, the faster I was able to like really hone in on the things that I felt were worth making out of clay. Mm -hmm. um, so I think drawing can be a great thing to just like keep the ideas going and then use those sketches to really like materialize your ideas when you are able to get back into the studio. For sure. It's nice. It's a nice way to just keep a record too of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, like because it is so immediate and you can literally just have your sketchbook sitting there like by your bed or, you know, you're like watching TV and you want to like sketch while you're watching TV and it's, you know, you don't make a mess. You don't have to clean up, you know, a bunch of clay dust when you're done. And it's just a nice way to keep to, and then you have something to go back to when you get to the studio. To I see. guess when I was in hand building, I was doing a lot of sketches of pots that I was going to make yeah. and I get inspired and I think about it, but I guess with throwing, it's more for me like surfaces. So maybe taking surfaces and figuring out shapes, you know, like taking things, actually tracing plates and things and then working on surfaces. So I can see both ways of doing it, both three dimensionally and then working on glazing and under glazing through tracing and a lot of other simple or simple drawings. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Planning for surface can can definitely happen with a with a sketchbook as well. Um, and then someone wrote in um, that uh, they, they bought some clay from the studio before we had to close. So uh, that's great. Make some stuff. Um, keep it nice and tidy and keep it, uh, if you can, try and keep it like leather hard so it's easy to transport. But depending on what it is, if it totally dries out, it's not the end of the world but just package it really carefully. And when we do reopen, we can certainly fire it. Yeah, that's a really good point to not let it dry out. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to show you, which is something that was made by Matt Smith. Ooh. So this is a porcelain bucket. And um, he made it actually by pinching pieces of clay. Wow. And pushing them into a bucket. Beautiful. This is really light. It's very thin. And um, I want to see if I can show you. I'm going to turn the computer around so I can try to show you how light actually com comes through this so you can see how thin it is. And um, that's one thing that's sort of like pe people who are like really into porcelain tend to kind of geek out on the fact that when it's thin enough, it will show light through it. I don't know if you can see this, let me know. Not quite, no. but. Oh, maybe over here. No, it's the light's not quite direct enough, huh? Maybe That's through bad. the bottom, I don't know. I think I'm too far away from the light. I, I can I, see it through the bottom a little bit. <laughs> I can definitely tell it's thin. Yeah. 
It's um, it's it's pretty impressive. Oh, maybe right here. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah there you go. Like... Wow. Yeah, it's really like starting to glimmer. You can see it. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So um, and I think the trick too with this was when pushing these pieces of clay in really like blending it and and also overlapping each piece so there weren't any pieces pressed and not kind of pushed one over top of another so super super blended mm -hmm. or not super blended but like pushed down and across a, enough of a space that was already there so that there's no cracks and no holes mm -hmm. even though it's really thin Great. Yeah. Cool. So, you know, I I didn't even show you my main work. Like that's just the stuff, you know. Well under, we'll have to do another we'll to do another, another part. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, I can see a piece behind you that looks are you working on that piece? Yeah, well so that that like kind of bird thing mm -hmm. is um just an older piece and that's just where it lives. Cool. And then there's like I have a big one down there. Oh, and then I also, okay, I'm going to show you one more thing. It's not pottery, but I got this out. I almost forgot about it. It's um, a sculpture that was made by Ashley Lyon. Can you see it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't know Ashley Lyon, she is an amazing artist and also an educator. She had the teaching fellowship at Alfred when I was there as a grad student. And I have to say, I learned more from her than I've ever learned from anyone in terms of how to build, how to think critically about your work. She's really, really incredible. So yeah, this is one of her pieces. Nice. That's a great piece. Yeah, f I'm familiar with with those lions. Yeah. Yeah. So. Cool. All right. Well, we'll have to do another part two on. We'll do like an underglaze focused. Cool. Talk. That would be great. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well. Thank you all so much for joining. And thanks for. Um, those of you who showed your faces, <laughs> Kristen, Laura, Lauren, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for showing us your stuff. Great. And of course, to everyone else who I didn't see, thanks for coming. Thank and you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks, everybody. We'll be in touch about we'll the next soon. session. Bye. 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 See you soon, Bye. guys. Bye. Everyone stay healthy. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.